Good evening, lifeboat. This is your captain speaking. I have returned for another day on the job. If you're wondering why my hat sits like this, it's because it doesn't fit over my headphones. So I'm trying to, I'm not trying to be cool. I'm just trying to wear it, you know? It might look silly. I might take it off. How is everyone tonight? Um, how is everyone tonight? Good to see you. Lumen, Seventh Son, Teresa Baldassari, Anne from MA, Mischief Manage, Lacey Silver, Tina Jenkins, Jason P, Krista Melinda, Scooby Lee. Good to see all of you. A Rolling Stone, Charlie Mullins. Dastardly, I hear you're really sick. I hope you feel better, all right? Take care of yourself. Get some rest. Whatever you need. Flamin Jackson. I'm honored. Tina Jenkins. All right. I'm not going to take too long on the roll call today. I am a little extra nervous. I think we're taking the hat off. We're going to have to figure that out another day. I, um, I'm a little extra nervous. You know, no matter how many times I do fire performances or speak in front of groups of people or do live streams or whatever the case might be. I always get a little nervous beforehand. Um, it just never, it's never something that doesn't happen. Um, you just kind of learn to deal with it and which is fine. That's manageable. But today my intentions are to tell y'all a little story about myself, you know, kind of how the, um, the Admiral, the acting Admiral, qualified himself in his first few videos. Um, I don't think that I necessarily need to do that, but I think it'll be fun. And I think that y'all deserve to get to know me a little better. So, you know, this probably is going to end up being like a little mini series. I don't think we're going to get through everything today, but we're going to start running down memory lane. Um, and that makes me a little extra nervous uh, just because it's, you know, a heavy story. It's close to my heart. It's something I've told you know, probably close to a million times, but uh, it hasn't been at any time recently. It's been it's been a number of years. It's been a very long time since um, I've visited this story. So maybe it's it's time. It's about time, anyways. Um. So yeah, I hope you guys enjoy. I'm sure I'm sure we're gonna have a good time. We're gonna I'm gonna stop and and hang out and talk in between points and whatnot. But uh, yeah, we're gonna we're gonna flesh it out <clears throat> before we do that. Uh, I'm going to be a YouTuber. Um, if you don't mind, if you do enjoy what's going on here, please hit that like and subscribe. Click that bell for notifications. And I hear if you click all on the notification bell that you won't get automatically unsubscribed by YouTube, which is cool. Uh, so if that's something you're into, go ahead and do that. Um, also, some housekeeping. What was my housekeeping? Oh, the journal. So I was working diligently on the journal all morning today, and I ran into problem after problem after problem. Um, some with software, some with compatibility, some with this, some with that. So I'm just, you know, it's just going to take a little longer, um, but I'm, I'm on it. it. It is near completion. I just need to, the details are important. Uh, it needs to work for everybody the same. It needs to be as intended for everybody. So I appreciate your patience, but, um, and, and it's coming. I'm excited to give it to you. Um, cool. So, you guys want to hear a little story about Spanx Calhoun? Um, I'm going to try and omit certain details um, and certain, like, yeah, certain details that, you know, for to protect people and to not, um, like, I don't want anyone to be bummed out, especially like family members or people that are a part of this. So, I probably won't say a whole lot of specific names or anything like that. But, uh, Love me from Salt Lake. Miss you tons. Proud of what you've become. I don't know who this is, but I really appreciate uh, shouting me out, Rex Putin. <clears throat> hey, WP. Sue B, Goddess Divine, Heather Rhodes. Miss Dragon. All right, I got to lube up the uh, lube up the old kisser here. Hold on. Talk about characters from history that are uh, 
just surrounded in mystery and, and wild stories. Rasputin is uh, quite a story. Quite a story. If y'all don't know who Rasputin is, he was the advisor to the Romanov family, which was the last dynasty in Russia before uh, the Bolshevik Revolution, which led to communism. Um, and maybe my details are a little wrong, but I'm 100% sure that Rasputin was the um, advisor, special advisor to the last, the last dynasty, the, the Romanov family, the last Tsars of Russia. And he is purported, re reported, purported to be like a, a madman, a holy man, a demon. Um, apparently when he was killed, he was shot, drowned, poisoned, stabbed. Like they had to really, really get this guy um, pretty good, apparently. Um, he, the stories surrounding Rasputin are intriguing, to say the least. I encourage you to check it out if you're into that kind of thing. Anyways, all right, back to the matter at hand. Anne Hummingbird, good to see you. Yes, sex addict. I heard that as well. Um, I heard he was just running around the palace rampant with that kind of thing. The original Mike Myers, that's hilarious. Hey, Valerie, good to see you. Butterfly 31. I... I want to know who Rasputin is. I'm going to think about that later. Lord Kiss Freak. We are honored. All right. So we'll breeze through the first portion of this because it's not super relevant. But from my age, from ages about two to 10 ish, I lived in Salt Lake City. I was born in Texas, but I only spent like, hold that thought. This is unprofessional. Thank you. I'm sorry. Hold on. You want to know what that was? I just wanted to make sure all my windows were closed because I don't want my neighbors to hear me telling my story. They haven't earned it. Anyways, um, yeah, Salt Lake City. Born in Texas. I only lived there till I was about two or something like that, and we moved, so... I don't have a lot of memories from there. The point of the story uh, kind of makes that time period relevant. But um, my time in Salt Lake as a kid, or, um, I think I've touched on this briefly. I have lots of fond memories hanging out with my dad. Um, he's told a lot of stories as well, like going skiing and snowboarding and um, you know, hanging out with him and his buddies, being on the trampoline, doing Legos, all kinds of stuff, going to the arcade. You know, I have lots of really good memories from my early, early childhood. Um, I also, and I'm sorry, mom and dad, um, I had a time, this bums you out. Um, but also I spent a lot of time alone. I spent a, a metric crap load of time uh, alone. And in fact, that's partially why I was so into Legos. I would, I had this big old tub of Legos. It was like as big as my living room table. And I would just dump it and I would play for hours and hours and hours and just keep myself entertained. Um, and that was because my parents were, I mean, at the time, I only know the truth, like, because hindsight's twenty twenty. But as a child, I had no idea what was going on. I just knew that they were locked in their room all the time and they wouldn't, you know, answer the door. Um, and I think it was about midway through fifth grade, we left Salt Lake. And they told me what had been going on. They came clean to me and said, like, hey, we've been doing drugs. They actually told me that what had been up, like, specifically. And uh, looking back on that, I thought that was a re that's a really interesting detail. Um, and they told me we were going to move to Reno. We're going to move to Nevada. We're going to start over and, you know, get our, our lives in order and everything was going to be great. And that wasn't really the case. Um, let me pull my, that wasn't really the case. We stayed with some family out there for a little while and then ended up getting our own spot. But this period happened so fast and I have a lot of like fuzzy memories from this period of time. I don't know exactly how long I spent in Reno, but I know it was about fifth grade. Um, cause sixth grade, I was already at the next stage of this story and 
fifth grade was in the middle of the fifth grade elementary school year was when I left Salt Lake. So I want to say it was about a year's worth of time, just about give or take a little bit that I spent in Reno, maybe a little more, a little less, right? Um, I remember I went to a year round school for a little while and, uh, it was like in the hood. Uh, there was like fights every day. I think we've told a story about the school where my dad had to come pick me up because I was in a, a fight or something. I was in a lot of fights in school. Um, um, also, bear with me and be patient, please. Um, a lot of this stuff is murky, so I might have to do some swimming in, in my head to, to pull out the proper, the proper um, details. But so things got worse in, in Reno, right? I said, you know, they told me they were going to do better and they didn't. That was not the case, right? So things totally got way worse in Reno. Um, and we had, I had four cats growing up. Ralphie Boy was my uh, my kitty cat. And he, that was the living in that apartment in Reno before I left. That was the last time I was to live with my cat, Ralph. Uh, the next time I would see him, it would be in photographs because he would he would pass uh, a few years later in my absence. And my dad would tell me later also that after I left, um, Ralph was like a broken hearted kitty. He was never the same. And that's pretty sad. I, uh, I miss that, that young little kitty. He was this huge fat cat and he didn't really take care of himself very well. He would like get dreadlocks in his fur like a lot. So in the summer, we would shave him like a lion and he would prance around, show off to all the other cats. It was so cute. It was so cute. Um, yeah, so I eventually was taken, taken in by family. Um, sent me a plane ticket to come live with them in California. And it was posed to me in, uh, in the way they said, you know, come visit us. So I was under the impression I was just visiting family, which is awesome. You know, I love doing that, especially when you're young. Right. Um, and they just never sent me back, which, you know, most likely saved my life and probably saved my mom and my dad's lives too. You know, everyone involved, honestly, that was the first move. I remember, I remember watching my mom detox in like a hotel room. I don't remember where we were when this happened there. This is like a memory I have that's out of place. I don't know where it fits in the timeline, but I do remember watching my mother detox off of heroin or I don't know, whatever it was, but she would have seizures in her sleep and scream. Um, that was pretty rough. That was pretty rough. But uh, yeah, I moved to California. My mother was pregnant with my sister at the time, came out and went to rehab out there. Um, so initially it was me and my grandparents, right? And my mom was living at a, a rehab and trying to get well and she was pregnant with my sister. And you guys, we've talked about this part of the story a little bit recently, so I'm gonna graze over that as well. Um, time goes on, this was sixth grade. And then by the time it was the summer before seventh grade, between sixth and seventh, my mom had completed her rehab, was doing really well, was doing the 12 step program, accumulating clean time. Um, this new person was involved that, you know, my mom had a relationship with. My sister had been born. Um, lots changed in this, in, in that fifth grade school year. And then the summer between sixth and seventh, Maybe it was seventh and eighth. Who's counting? Um, we moved into our own little place, me, my mom, and her new partner, and Allison. Um, and we uh, lived there for quite a while. Um, I went to high school there, I went to middle school there. Um, and this is the beginning of my substance abuse story. This is the meat and potatoes. I caught that gnat with my hand. This is where my substance abuse begins. Gypsy Daisy, how old was I when? Uh, 
Oh, with the the story out of place. Um, I want to say it was before leaving Reno, and be- wait, yeah, before leaving Reno, it was in the transition between Reno and California. I think so. It must have been about fifth grade like maybe 10, 11. I know that I went to California when I was 11. Me and my, my grandma uh, would watch NCIS every Thursday. That was our thing. I've seen every episode. <laughs> that is not a boast. That is just the truth. Thanks, Patty. I'm glad you're here. I lived in California for quite some time, Um, lots of formative years here. Um, So it was sixth and seventh and eighth, ninth, 10th and 11th grade. Um, Senior year, I spent somewhere else. But yeah, my substance abuse began, I want to say freshman year of high school. So we spent maybe a year, year and a half in, in that house. In um, Los Alamitos before um, I was to even touch, you know, anything, even alcohol really. And when I started, I started with weed and alcohol. And, you know, every now and again, there would be a painkiller. I don't think that started until a little later though. Um, Initially, it was just weed and drink. And initially, it was a way to fit in. I remember having the views because of specifically because of my experience with my parents and moving around and like just things being so messed up, like having a like anti drug mentality, like I was not into it. I was terrified of it, you know, and I didn't know the difference between this and that. It just, it was all, it was all what had, 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 you know, ripped my family apart. Oh, I think I skipped something. Oh no, that's coming up right here. Yeah. Me and my dad's relationship was, um, very special to me. Um, when I moved to California from Reno, my dad stayed in Reno. Um, and that was, I I would see him. I could count the times I saw him on one hand, uh, between the time that he like, like started the lifeboat and, and then one hand for sure. I might need a sixth finger, but I, I doubt it. Um, we talked constantly. We wrote letters. We talked on the phone. Um, but like in my in my mind in my seventh grade brain i just wanted my family to be whole again you know i just wanted us all to be a family again and that would that notion uh would shape my like path moving forward that was a really really big deal for me um and that was never ever going to happen and i didn't know that but that was never going to come to pass it just never was and it never will and that's okay But at the time it broke me, it it crushed me, Um, you know, and it was everyone else's fault. It was my mom's fault. You know, it was grandma, grandpa's fault. It was my dad's fault. It was my fault, you know, whatever. It just, uh, it sucked. So not having a male role model uh, for like those years was really hard, you know. I had some uncles try try to step in. I had, you know, my grandpa was actually a really great role model, but, you know, he wasn't there for the whole beginning. And his relationship, him and my relationship was not me and my dad's relationship, you know? So there was some other stuff going on in my head, at least, and in my heart. So, you know, uh, I just wanted, I just wanted my dad back or whatever. Um, And I think, yeah, I think that's a really important part of my story. There's still some un like resolved trauma from my childhood and from my past. And I'm aware of that, but I'm not entirely sure 
which part of it it is. I'm not, you know, and I've gone through this story and, and dug this crap up so many times that it hurts, you know? So maybe that's, maybe that's a key piece right there that I need to, to, to go through, you know, is, uh, my relationship with my father and how, and how uh, it was like ripped, ripped away from me, you know, um, definitely worth writing about in the journal later, I think. So that's pretty much the first third of what I had planned to tell you guys. We're only 30, 20 minutes into this sucker. Thoughts, comments, let's talk about it. That sucks, mischief managed. I'm sorry to hear that. Yeah, parents are important. Role models are important. Oh, did you miss the beginning, Tara? I'm sorry. <clears throat> if I sound less excited, it's because I'm like armoring my myself against sadness. I'll be happy here in just a minute. Give me a sec. Thank you, Anique. Much love right back at you, all right? Um, initially in California, um, I was in the Dara Ranch, and then um, the house that we were all living in after uh, or when, when I went to high school and all that, that was in Los Alamitos. Used to go to the beach every every Saturday on the bus. Man, California was really cool. I tell you what, it was way cool. Um, but we we partied like like we wanted the wheels to fall off. I remember like when when we when I first started partying and, and abusing substances, I was out there hustling after school. I was asking adults for money for the bus. I was making up lies. I was stealing stuff. Like I immediately was engaged in like deranged not in my right mind behavior, like immediately, immediately. And looking back on that today, when I was going over the story in my head, I was like, wow, I was immediately hustling. Like I just immediately out there lying to people, stealing from people just to get, just to get weed, you know, weed and alcohol, robbing stores, robbing people. That's wild. You know, I never really looked at that in such stark a contrast, like went from I'm not ever going to do drugs because it ripped my family apart to, you know, I'm going to rob and steal and lie and cheat my way to getting high every single day. Like, like so fast. Oh, my. Scary, terrifying. But what we're dealing with is something that's very insidious. You know, we talk about addiction being a disease or um, like the addicts having a disease. I don't know what the right terminology for that is, right? But like there's something in the brain, of, in the brain of addicts that is different than everyone else, right? So if that's the case, uh, like those symptoms, right? Those symptoms, absolutely out of my mind, deranged behavior just hustling like that, like that kind of makes a little bit more sense when viewed through that lens. Sometimes you wake up in the morning and, and like all of a sudden, you, you know, and pardon me for making it a little graphic, but you got to go from both ends. You're sick, you know, it's just boom. It's a big deal. Or sometimes you wake up and you've got a crazy high fever, you know? Uh, I think that uh, at some point there was some stimuli, there was some decision that I made. There was some group that I fell into. There was some secret CIA code word, who I probably shouldn't have said that, um, you know, said to me that unlocked addict behavior, you know, obviously it's not like that was a joke, but you know what I mean? At some point there was a switch that flipped and, um, and I was on, I was on board the crazy train and I wasn't getting off, you know, and in my mind, I wasn't saying I'm getting on this crazy train. It was like, this makes me feel good. I don't have to think about how much I hurt, you know? It was an escape and, you know, 
looking back, it was always, always, every single time, bar none, about an escape. It was about not dealing with what was on my plate. It was about not feeling what I was feeling. It was about numbing out. You know, there were some social aspects to it, but I mean, I can, I got, I, I got the social thing. It's all right. You know, um, that definitely wasn't uh, the main thing there. And yeah, sudden change. I don't know. It's crazy. It's crazy to think about the places that I've been and where I am now. And I don't know if you guys have heard of this. Uh, there's a thing called imposter syndrome. Um, and I feel like I have that real bad. Sometimes I feel like like the suits are going to come in and be like, oh, you're not qualified to do this, you know, like, um, but uh, I totally am, you know, this is a subject, my story that I'm quite an expert on, you know, but I totally like that's, that's a part of my journey is feeling worthy after all of that stuff. Spanx, I never had a mother. She abandoned us four young kids. She was a drunk. Now I'm a mom of three. Tell them I love them every day. They've grown to be three beautiful, successful young kids. And you know, that's, that's breaking the cycle right there, crazy girl. If I had a trophy, I would raise it to you. How about this glass of water? I raise this to you, crazy girl. Thank you for breaking that cycle. And I'm going to be a cycle breaker too. I don't know if I'll have kids, but if I do, I promise you their, their upbringing is going to be vastly different from mine. Does everyone have imposter syndrome? I guess that makes a lot of sense. Ben Bacon Bits, I'm glad that, um, I'm glad you're here anyways, man. Hope I did all right telling that intro portion. Yeah, we need some trophies in here, don't we, Flamin' Jackson? I think part of me not being sure if I'm going to have kids is fear of not succeeding at being a father. <laughs> Thanks, Ben. You're the man. Thanks, Aria. All right, would you say we we get into the the meat and potatoes here, huh? As we go into this next section, there's going to be a lot more details because it's a lot fresher. So it'll probably be a lot longer. That'll be good. Being a father is the most most profound teacher for me. I love that statement. You know, when I initially got sober, not this time around, but like the very first time getting sober, I did it through a 12 step program. And when I got to the end of the steps, the final step, the 12th step is to pass it on, take someone else through the steps the way that you were taken through the steps, basically be a sponsor, you know, you get some sponsees. And that was explained to me, like, it's the steps after the steps, like the 12th step is basically doing all 12 steps again, but with someone else. So you're going back and like the work continues, right? The learning continues, the healing continues. And I, that statement right there, being a father is the most profound teacher for me, made me think of that. Now that I've been given this gift, I give it to someone else, you know, and I give them as, as good as I possibly can. I don't know if that 
if that makes sense to y'all. Thank you for saying so, Miss Sunrise Dawn. We'll uh, get the opportunity opportunity to find out one day, I'm sure. I wonder if I've got some fruit in here that needs to be thrown away. Where did the gnats come from? All right. You guys are great. Thanks for hanging out with me. Substance abuse, freshman year. Robin stealing a lion. Yeah, my, once my behavior turned in that direction, I was a great student until I started partying. I was a fantastic student. I didn't even have to try. I could sneeze on a test to get an A. Um, and I did every friggin' time. And when I started partying, I started paying less attention, started caring less. Um, it became school and, and succeeding became secondary to this thing that I had found that made me way happier, you know? Uh, so I almost didn't graduate high school. Um, school became a huge point of contention between me and, and my mother. Um, and my recreational, like things that I did for fun became a huge point of contention between us. When I would do something wrong, one of the ways that she would punish me is she would take things that I, like my possessions that I liked, like my guitar, like uh, my books, like uh, like my stereo, like my music, like everything. Like I remember she would take everything. And, and when I say it, when I say that, like I, it didn't work when she took one thing, so she would take another kind of thing. You know, like I forced her hand to taking all of my stuff. Um, she left the books until very last. Um, but that, you know, things that made me happy, my joy as, as an idea, like just my joy became a point of contention between us. You know, I couldn't be happy. I couldn't live a life. Um, because I was on punishment all the time because I, you know, had, it became this vicious cycle where I backed out because I was pissed off and then she would take my things and things would get worse at home. And then I would act out because things were, you know, not cool at home. And then I would, I started like running away, sneaking out at a certain point, I made the decision that I didn't care what she said anymore. It was the same thing on repeat broken record. Like. We were not making any headway. I understood what she wanted. I wasn't going to give it to her. I did not understand why. I just knew what I wanted. I knew what was going on inside me. And, and, uh, and, and I knew, uh, you know, she wasn't willing. I don't know. I don't know. I just knew it wasn't, it wasn't fuck. It wasn't working out. So things progressed, got worse and worse and worse. And I ended up getting kicked out of my mom. So my mom sent me to rehab for two weeks because that's how long the insurance would pay for it. Um, and she must have thought that I was on some kind of crazy hard drugs or something. Cause like the way that she treated me up until this point, like from the point that we like, she kicked me out to the point that I was in rehab. They will walk, I walk in the door and immediately get drug tested and she immediately gets the results or maybe it was a little later on or something, but you immediately get that drug test, right? When she realized that it was just weed in my system, she had this look on her face, like what the heck? Like she was so blown away. Um, but you know, that's where our relationship had come to. There was no trust. We were enemies, you know, we're family, we love each other. Right. But like at that, at that point in time, we, we were not uh, on the same team. And I would never, I would not forgive her for that for a very long time for, for shipping me off after, after uh, the two weeks insurance thing was up, she picked me up from rehab with all my stuff in the trunk of the car and dropped me off. She took me straight to the airport. My mom's going to look a little bad in this part, but I mean, sorry. It's all right. We have a great relationship now. I love her. I'm super grateful for our relationship now. It is magical. It's amazing. You know, 
um, it could have gone so much worse, you know, and now we're friends now, now we're family, you know, now we, we talk, um, I tell her things, I don't lie to her, you know, um, yeah, the fact that we have a relationship at all is, is a blessing. So, but you know, this part of the story, you know, not, not mom's best look. And I'm not saying that she did anything wrong. I'm just saying the way that this part of the story looks isn't good. <laughs> this is a part of the story that I still have some personal qualms with, you know, like I understand that I was a handful, but man, you're going to like ship me off. Like I'm like a package dude, you know? And then that didn't work. I spent a year with this family member that I got shipped off to. And then they dropped me off at the freaking homeless shelter with other family members flew in from out of town for this occasion. Like, like they were taking me to, like they were dropping me off at daycare. You know, like they were dropping me off at summer camp. They pulled up at the homeless shelter, filled out some paperwork, like custody paperwork or something. Like it was like my, my 18th birthday. So maybe there wasn't paperwork, like custody paperwork, but it was interesting. I, don't, I still hold neg negativity in my heart for that. And, uh, you know, I have a great relationship with everyone involved in this part of the story, but that hurt, dude. I don't understand. Like objectively, I, I can see why they did what they did, but like emotionally, I can't understand how they did that, you know, and that maybe that's not for me to understand and that's okay too, dude, whatever. But yeah, my, my family took my, my family uh, dropped me off at the homeless shelter. So I skipped a little bit there just for that point. But um, yeah, after rehab for weed, I went to rehab for weed, y'all. Let's go. Um, then I went to uh, Hesed House. Oh, wait, no, pardon me. I skipped the family member. Yeah, I did senior year living with this family member in a different state entirely. Um, and I graduated. I graduated from high school by, by, my, by my, the hair on my chinny chin chin. I graduated somehow. Um, I remember um, the contention between me and that family member got so bad that, you know, they couldn't have me around or whatever anymore. On my 18th birthday, they decided to take me to the home, the homeless shelter or whatever. Um, but I was still in school. My 18th, my birthday's in February. The school year ends after that. So I was living at the homeless shelter a city away and they would send the bus at like the, the butt crack of dawn to pick me up at the homeless shelter. Like someone in the administration of the, of the school was really pulling strings for me, was really looking out. Like they saw potential or something and they really wanted me to graduate really bad. My Dean, actually, I remember, I don't remember his name, but my Dean, I would not have graduated without my Dean. <clears throat> and yeah, they would pick me up at the homeless shelter and drive me to school and then Drop me back off at the homeless shelter afterwards. Actually, I don't think that I. No, there there was a bus to go back after. I just wouldn't take it a lot. Yeah, I ended up at the homeless shelter in Aurora, Illinois, Hesed House, Lake Street. Represent humble beginnings. I was in contact with my dad on and off through all of this. Uh, there were times that he um, was in prison. There were times that he wasn't. There was times that we were talking. There was times that we were uh, emailing. There was times that we were writing letters and there was times where we weren't talking. Um, it was just, you know, we, we did the best we could. You know, I know at some, some points it was too painful for him to correspond with me. But um, I don't remember when that was. I don't remember where he was, but it was one of the times that he was inside. But um, no, we uh, 
we stayed in as steady contact as possible. And I would end up seeing him, like I said, a handful of times before the end of this story. And I don't really know at what point they were. I remember I took a Greyhound bus to go visit him a number of times. I remember taking a road trip with a roommate to go visit him a, a time or two. I remember uh, he came to see me a time or two. Um, he was there for Cedar's birth. Um, yeah, I have no, I can't place a lot of those. A lot of these memories just blend, but. Hi, internet mom. <laughs> yes, sir, Seventh, that is correct. I wouldn't change a damn thing. That's right. Thank you for saying that. You know, Lord Kiss Freak, I owe my mother a phone call. We haven't spoken in too long. It's been just like a, like a month or something, right? But that's far too long. We texted maybe a couple weeks ago, but I need to I need to call her, speak to her on the phone. She would appreciate that, I bet. You know, Rolling Stone, Rolling Stone says, Spanx, I'm 58, and I'm still trying to forgive my parents for certain things. Some days I feel they're forgiven, some not. I'm working on it. Maybe that is something that we all have to deal with. That's very interesting. Thanks for sharing that, Rolling Stone. If I was faced in that situation, I don't know. I've never been a parent and I've never been a heroin addict. So there are two factors that I can't relate with. But I think I, I, think I would uh, have explored other options. It didn't involve shipping my kid off, you know? Like what you're going to say, oh, I can't, I can't do this. I can't be a mom. Well, I mean, kind of too late for that. It's kind of 14 years too late. And maybe that's cold and harsh. Probably is. I think that a lot of my, you know, emotions from the past are probably not rational, you know? They're emotional. But this is how I feel, you know? I'm not saying it's justified, but those are real emotions that I acknowledge that exist inside of me, you know? And I think that's an important part of, of processing through grief and trauma and loss is accepting that it's real. It happened. And it's in the past. It's okay now. You know, it's not okay that it happened, but like right now in this moment, it's like, we're fine. I'm good. Look how it turned out. Look where I'm sitting. Look what we're doing. You know, I can choose to be happy or I can choose to dwell on this monstrous path that I was forced to walk this this terrible hand of poker I was dealt at birth. Oh, why me? Why me? I'm so put upon. No, I will never do that. I'll never be that friggin' guy. You know? And I feel grateful and lucky that I feel that way because I notice some people don't feel that way. Some people have a really hard time making the transition from victim mentality to empowering themselves. And I don't think that's something that you can teach. I think it's something that you have to find within oneself. And I'm super grateful. I don't think that I had a very hard time um, with that lesson. Well, I shouldn't say that, though. I think the hardest part about the trauma surrounding my childhood and my upbringing, the hardest part about it was um, whatever we were just talking about that I forgot. That'll be funny to watch later. Um, cool. All right. I feel like I definitely have thoughts like this too. I also think hindsight's twenty twenty. I really got to cut my parents some slack, you know? Izzy E says, in my teens, I would have liked for my parents to just admit they didn't know what to do. Apologize when they engaged in abusive behavior. Just hugs, honesty, and vulnerability. And you know, viewed through that lens, put in those terms, it seems real simple, don't it? It seems real simple, don't it? Um, it is scientifically proven that you cannot be emotional and rational at the same time. Uh, the left and the right side of the brain work together, but not in tandem. So if you're emotional, 
and you're trying to be rational, you have to separate the emotions before you're capable of the rationality. Um, and I don't know why that was relevant. I'm starting to get a little spotty in the head. I wonder what's going on. Maybe I'm tired. Can I, I'm going to tell you guys what happened after the stream last night. Thank you, Tampa B man. Thank you for saying that. And you know, Tony Suter, you are amazing. It's so sad, but you rebuilt a family with forgiveness. Your dad clearly could not love you more. I am so fortunate for the relationship that I have with my father. Good night, Rasputin. I'm going to find out who you are and give you a call. Oh, I think I do know who that is, actually. Wow. Thanks for stopping by. Love you, too. Barely, Goddess Divine. Goddess Divine asks if I slept after the live. That second pot of coffee was a mistake. Let me tell you, I have reduced my caffeine intake by 50% today. And it's not a clean 50%. I'm just being lazy with my math. Usually, I have a pot of coffee in the morning. I'll have some sort of caffeine later on whether it's pre-workout or an energy drink or more coffee. Um, and usually before the lifeboat, whether I'm doing it or I'm in the background, whatever, sometime around five or six, I'll have either a cup of coffee or another half pot. You know, so we're talking, we're talking like somewhere around 700 milligrams of coffee, being lazy on a daily basis. That can't be healthy, right? Today, I had a, a, a cup of coffee in the morning. It was left over from after the live stream last night. So I had a cup of cold coffee and, uh, and then I had like a, an energy drink. I don't know, uh, after lunch, a little bit after lunch, after I got up from my nap to jumpstart my, um, uh, my, my journal stuff and, uh, my prep work for this. So I think I've, I've had, I might even have cut my milligrams down by 500. I might've cut, I might've cut it by three quarter, 75%. So. Um, that also might be why I'm a little tired. I also am going to sleep much better tonight. I'll probably be in bed by 10. Um, <laughs> so that's pretty cool. I'm thankful for that. Yeah, I'm feeling a little tired and less focused. This morning, I felt amazing, 100%, 110%. I felt focused, motivated. Um, yesterday, I also felt really, really good. I think that was more to do with like my mental state with uh, being so excited to do this. But today was a market difference. Today was, uh, or this evening, this afternoon was a market difference. That's right. Someone once told me, I believe it was a, a home economics teacher my senior year told me that the breakfast of champions was cereal and beer. I was like, ugh, I don't even like that, dude. What? That's gross. <laughs> oh, it's Hunter. This is uh, one of my best friends in the whole wide world. The routine. Twin Forever says, good to set a bedtime routine. Uh, the routine is essential and benefits me so much. And there's some part of me that is just naturally opposed to having a routine. I don't know why, uh, but I recognize that it benefits me largely. So I try to implement it. Yeah, I am going to be in bed sooner than 10, Goddess Divine. I'm trying to make uh, the most out of this, but I'm probably going to end up bumping out of here early, but not right now. We're, we got some talking to do. I had a kid at 14. I don't know what James says. My parents kicked me out. We have since reconnected and are on great terms. Both sets of parents. The military saved me. I'm married to that amazing woman 25 years later. Wow. What a story. You know, I don't think we can ever tell how things are going to work out judging by the starting point. And I don't think we can ever tell 
quite where things originated from, judging strictly by the end. And it's all that stuff in between that really matters. We need to readjust this. I am no longer comfortable. Please hold. Yesterday was back day and my back hurts a lot. <laughs> I can't get comfortable, in fact. I'm super happy to know and notice that there's no freeze freezing, freeze framing of the captain today. That's pretty sweet. And I'm also happy to report that I have a tech whiz willing and ready to help me with that. And after this, after this stream, we probably will be going over particulars of the journal as well as uh, technical issues with the stream. So we will have, we will be seeing upgrades. That means I did that workout twin forever. That's correct. Five by five. Am I good? I'm good. These looked like tacos to me for a second, but they're little streamers. Yeah, it's the journey, not the destination, Kim Roy. That's right. The jaunty chapeau. I do like the jaunty chapeau as well. Although you have to... I wish it wasn't such a sharp angle there. That's not bad. How about Reese's hat today? That thing was stellar. I really dug that. I don't know. I think... Personally, for me, it has something to do with my neurodivergence, Tara. Why are we so resistant to routines, uh, says Tara, smiling. I do well with one, but I like the idea of freedom. And, you know, I'm glad you used that word choice, freedom, when I initially was complaining about routines implemented by my parent overlords when I was young. Uh, freedom was the, the feeling that I cited in opposition to their routine. Um, it's very interesting. You have a calcified tendon in your shoulder. What is that? I'm going to have to figure out what that is. That doesn't sound like it's not painful, though. Oh, my. I hope you uh, I hope you can get that figured out and feel better, Mischief. I've never even heard of such a thing. I guess your tendons are supposed to have some elasticity to them. So calcification, I assume, would mean that it's hardening. So it's not doing its job properly and probably is very painful, as you say. But I'm not a doctor. I don't know, James. Thank you so much for the support. I think routine sets discipline and discipline structures your life in a manageable way. Doing the little things right in life ensures you execute the big things in general, in my opinion. You know, I think I agree with you. It are It is the little things that comprise the big things and to execute our big plans properly. I think it takes a whole lot of baby steps and little details that are really important. Good night, Sue B. I'm currently working on some other time slots so that we um, don't have to stay up so late. I'm not saying that we're going to stop doing the seven. I'm just saying I'm aware that, you know, it's not right for everyone. So I'm going to try and get some midday stuff going. Uh, in the next few days, all right? Blanketed my tendon, oh my. Let's get some, some ones in here for Mischief Managed. She's gotta be in some serious pain. Let's pray for a quick resolution. Killing this East Coaster. Oh, you know, it would help if I was like in the middle. Then I could like service both sides, right? But I think we're just going to have to pick pick two like we have and then spot it, or spot it all up in the middle like a Dalmatian. Um, and as I become like, so yesterday's format is quite different from today's format, right? And that's by design. Um, I want to keep things fresh interesting. I also want to try different stuff, different ideas that I've had. Um, I also want feedback from the crew. 
also, while I'm thinking about it, if any of you make it over to thelifeboat.live, our website, um, if you have any any uh, questions or comments or feedback, like the whole website is pretty much you know still a work in progress. So if there's anything that you want to see out of our website, um, if there's any yeah suggestions that you have, please let me know. Email me. Uh, let me know here in the comments. You can email me at sober at myyahoo.com. Um, if you, I'm going to create a section on there called uh, Pets of the Lifeboat or something to that effect. So if you want pictures of your pet to be featured on the Lifeboat website, I'm going to say that again. If you want pictures of your pet to be featured on the Lifeboat website, send them. Send pictures of your pets. Um, and with the picture of your pet that you send to sober at myyahoo.com, send the name of your pet as well so that I can post a picture of them with a name. What I'm envisioning is like on the homepage, there's a bunch of pictures. I don't know exactly where on the website I remember seeing this, but there's a bar of pictures that constantly rotates, constantly rotates. We could theoretically put an an unlimited number of cute pet photos into this little bar of slideshows. And it would constantly scroll through Roscoe, you know, squirrel nut zipper, you know, like um, it would just be a really cool way for, I know we're all into fur, fur babies. We're all into our feline and our feral friends. So uh, if you guys think that's a great idea, I do as well. Let me know. Yeah, my email at sober at myyahoo.com. You can also, I mean, honestly, I'm going to read every comment. I'm going to, um, I'm going to be checking the emails. I'm going to, um, I probably won't go through every live chat, but I'm most likely, um, I'm not going to miss a whole lot of things that are said. Um, I might miss things initially, but I intend to be pretty thorough. So if, if that's a desire of yours, you can put it pretty much anywhere. Let me know. Um, do, do, do also if uh if lifeboaters are getting together and to hang out and to meet and stuff if you guys take any pictures having fun i would love to put those on the website as well um i for a long time struggled to think of what kind of media we would put on the website like like pictures of people connecting what does that even look like you know and that could look like so many different things so um i'm open to ideas and whatnot Barbie says, on day three of my bathroom renovations, my anxiety is through the roof. Lucky Reno guys are very nice. Tomorrow will be finished. Well, hey, man, you're already there, right? You're on the home stretch now. Sorry to hear about your anxiety. I hope that uh, hope you get some, some solid sleep, and I bet you that bathroom will be beautiful tomorrow. I bet it will be beautiful. Monty, nail through the foot. I've done that. I'm sorry to hear that. I'm glad he is uh, healing up, though. That's good to hear. Yeah, send me the mocha. Send me the mocha. And if you are sending pet pics uh, to the email, will you put pet pics in the subject so that I like can group them easy? I'm going to put all the pet pics together so I don't have to search. They're just all hanging out together and then I can start adding them and I'll, I'll end up having to like, po like put the name on the photo so that it's one piece or whatever, but, but that's above y'all's pay grade. I don't need to explain that, but I will end up putting the name on the picture and then putting it on the website. So You got your kitty on the Epsom salt bass. That's hilarious. What a pampered, well taken care of kitty cat. I bet you, uh, Monty's looking beautiful. Oh, after the live stream last night, did we, did we talk about that? I was so wired. I was jazzed up. Maybe it was the extra coffee. Maybe it was the boat and me just having all kinds of, uh, um, all kinds of excitement from this. I'll post the email again. Sober at myyahoo.com. Sober at myyahoo.com. 
Um, and you can always rewind later, you know, if you missed it, all right? Um, yeah, I was wired last night, so I tried to play some video games to like relax. It didn't really work a whole lot. I hung out with some friends and like we were talking and I was telling them about what had happened. And that just like got me more excited talking about it. Um, so I went for like a little walk and uh, was just thinking about all kinds of stuff and my mind was racing. So I like, I, I walked it out and then I journaled about it. I did a little bit of uh, exercising and then I got on the phone with a buddy for like about an hour. Um, I think I went to bed at like one or one thirty, but I was, a, I was attempting to expend energy from the time that I hit end stream to the, to the time I closed my eyes at like one thirty ish. And that's how long it took. Um, I play lots of different video games, Kristen. Right now I'm playing a lot of League of Legends. Um, I've been playing Helldivers too. Uh, but as I get further down this path, I think that things are going to have to change if I'm going to keep playing those two games. I don't think that my data is secure uh, with those games on this computer. So I'm either going to need a gaming computer that's separate from like my work or... I'm going to have to choose games that uh, have trustworthy anti-cheat. But that's a whole nother conversation. I grew up playing like StarCraft and Command and & Conquer and X-Wing Starfighter Simulator. <laughs> that was the best game, dude. I remember having a joystick when I was really little. My grandpa had like a joystick and you could pick like all the different... Uh, Rebel ships like the A-Wing and the B-Wing and all this different stuff. And the X-Wing and you know would have like star fights. You know, you could shoot torpedoes, you'd have shields. You could switch your shield power from the front to the back to like maximize. You could, it was super tactical, super cool. The joystick was killer. Um, and I remember there was a version of that game at some point where you could pick um, like dark side craft, like the, um, like the TIE fighters, the TIE interceptors. That one was my favorite. I was always fascinated with villains growing up. I still am to this day. StarCraft is classic. Do you play, Kristen? Or are you just a, an a enjoyer? I still play StarCraft. I, I'm not any good. Um, but I play the crap out of it. Mario Kart is classic. I remember when... Oh, we haven't gotten to that part of the story yet. I was about to skip ahead in in uh in the story to tell you about Mario Kart. I used to play a ton of World of Warcraft, and World of Warcraft and I have this special relationship. Remember when I was telling you my mom um, would take the things that I liked and hold them over my head and like to try to get me to do good in school and to not act out and you know screw around with my friends um world of warcraft was obviously the coolest thing in the entire world to me in my mother's eyes and boy was she right but man i didn't get to play that game until i was a friggin adult and that'll do stuff to you you know like when i finally got my hands on that game i tore it apart i was a no lifer i finally was like it was like I was completing a mission, like a quest that I had set out on when I was 16, like like metaphorically, you know what I mean? Like I played World of Warcraft with a vengeance when I finally got around to playing it because I was never able to play it and I had this huge desire to play it for so long. I thought that was kind of fun. But so, you know, I would fall in and out of love with that game over a long, long period of time and very, very recently, I think I finally accepted that I'm over it. And then I'm, I'm talking like, like a month ago tops. Um, so I've been playing WoW in the past two months. You know, I've, I've very recently. I play quite a bit of Diablo, although I'm very disappointed personally with D4. I have um, put my ARPG chips into the last epoch box. I'm not a fan of PoE.
L4D4. I feel like I should know what this is, Jason P. And you're going to laugh at me if, for not knowing. And when you tell me, I'm going to be like, oh, I knew that. But what's that? Oh my gosh, Mr. Ray Ray. Were you a jar peer? Please don't tell me you were a jar peer, dude. Come on. Oh yeah, Left for Dead. That's a good one. I do enjoy that. I had no idea that uh, y'all were gamers. You know, Barbie, there's something to be said for nostalgia. You know, songs that you listen to when you were in a certain joyous state of mind or a certain like beautiful chapter of life or when you were with that one person, that certain person, music, games, media in general, I think elicits all kinds of uh, emotions and can be attached to. A Minecraft, I have um, an uncle who's an architect and when Minecraft first came out, I remember he showed me what he had built in Minecraft. My architect uncle, he had like elevators and staircases and like secret rooms. And he had like the manse. He had the mansion. I thought that was pretty sweet. Are you talking Pong? Boop. Talking Pong. I'm familiar. My old roommate used to work for Gearbox. I have to tell you, I am a huge Borderlands fan. Um, I saw that Borderlands 3 was on sale for 20 bucks or something like that yesterday. Almost bought it. So glad I didn't. I can't really be, I can't afford video games right now. I have some responsibilities and uh, I have goals. I have places that I'm headed, you know, and uh, buying $20 Borderlands 3 video games is not going to get me there. But I have to say, I was so tempted. It's been on my wish list for so long. And I have owned all of them. I just don't currently own that one. Upset? What did I miss, Valerie? I'm going to scroll back up and find out what's going on. Hope you're all right. Oh, your Minecraft game got gone. You got all your data deleted after literally two years, which, okay, I'm an adult. And okay, it's my fault because I lost my email account, so I can't sign in. But, you know, I have to say, do you remember when... Um, when we first started having logins to accounts, we had emails and passwords and whatnot. And the first time you hit forgot password and you had to reset it. Now that process, I'm willing to bet an insurmountable amount of money, an unreal, let's say, amount of money that that process today is black and white different and far more complicated. Um, I think that that process, we have like the security of my password has become like so friggin' it, like it has become more important than like ease of use, than like being able to reset my password safely and easily. There are accounts that I have that I also can't access because the forgot, the, the restore process, the process for forgotten passwords is so convoluted and full of crap that it's just impossible. Blizzard, the company that does World of Warcraft, is the first example of a company that I ended up dealing with that with. Um, I think I have multiple accounts with Blizzard that I just don't have access to. They are the worst for account uh, security. When I say the worst, they're so, so crazy about it that uh, it, it ends up being the, the opposite of of effective. It's insane. It's absolutely insane. Jedi Academy. Are you kidding me, Mr. Ray Ray? I played the crap out of this game. I remember for those that don't know this game, it had like a story mode and like a campaign, but you could also go online and play different game modes. And there were guns and there were lightsabers. Um, and there was a game mode called Duel. And there was like, you know, you could have a certain number of people in the room at a time, but it would two people would face off a lightsaber duel in this video game. 
and everyone in the room would watch and wait their turn and it would go one at a time. And, you know, whoever was next would face the winner of the previous duel. There was like three fighting styles. You could like press a button to like change your style. There was like a quick style, a balanced and like a heavy style where you would like move really quickly and like do all these overhead strikes that would do hella damage. And oh, I played this game for countless hours. Me and my uncle, my uncle turned me on to that game. There was like force powers and you could download skins so you could play as any character. I was Darth Vader all the dang time. One of my favorite moves was to use the strong style, you know, so we're like fighting or whatever. And then I would switch to the quick style really quickly and crouch and cut their legs back and forth. That won me a bunch. That won me a bunch of matches. <laughs> Just give him the cutter real quick, you know, and then back to. <laughs> I remember VCRs. I remember tapes. Um, I was a youngster, but I was coherent. I was conscious. KOTOR is one of the greats for sure. I can't believe we're talking about video games right now. We went from from traumatic childhood to this game is if this game was still able to be played in the capacity that it was when it first came out, I would attack it with a vengeance like I attacked World of Warcraft. For those that don't know, this was the massively multiplayer online Star Wars game where you could like you could be a bounty hunter, a Jedi, a, a mercenary, a, you know, a smuggler. You could, you know, it was like a, a fantasy game where you pick your class and, you know, invest in skills and go on adventures, but it was in the Star Wars universe. That was the freaking coolest thing in the whole world. I never played it. The concept is mind blowing. Can you tell that this is way more exciting to me than talking about my past? I think the past is important, very valuable. You know, often uh, the hard work is the good work, you know? Um, but yeah, I think it's good to decompress and talk about fun crap after that. Final Fantasy and Zelda are a part of me. My sister, Cedar, y'all know her. Um, I'm going to out her right now. She is a Zelda super fan. And I love it. Um, I remember bonding with her at a very, very young age over Zelda. Um, and to this day, she's a huge Zelda fan. We talk about it all the time. Whenever a new game comes out, we'll nerd out and chat about it and giggle like little girls, both of us. I love her. Your ex was a droid maker. Are we role playing? <laughs> you got to balance the trauma with the fun. Do you remember the pod racer game that was like at Dave and Buster's where you would actually sit in the thing and it would have the, the steering and like the gas like lever and all that. It was kind of like the need for speed game, but it was a, Pod racer, next level. Next level. Oh, pod racing in Star Wars Galaxies? I didn't even know that was the thing. Oh, you're talking about the droid maker. Oh, I'm a little slow sometimes. This is exactly what I needed to jumpstart uh, my energy, though. Wow, what a what a cool profession. When I was younger, I thought I might want to be like a lawyer or like a video game designer, but neither of those were to be. Mario Bros. is always a classic. Zelda frustrated the heck out of me, too. Um, I think I probably spent the most amount of time playing the Ocarina of Time, and I never officially beat that one. I did beat the last boss because my cousin had a save file that was right saved right there at the, at the end with all the stuff. So I played that fight about countless times. But on my own playthrough, there was a temple, a dungeon called the Water Temple, and I would get stuck there every freaking time. There weren't enough keys to open all the doors. So if you spent your keys on the wrong doors, you were just SOL. And that's what I was in. Zelda Ocarina of Time, every time. Droid Maker. I didn't even know that was a, a thing. That's so cool. That's what I'm talking about. I, I feel like Star Wars Galaxy deserves a reboot. You know? What gamer? Casino levels are the best. 
We're talking Sonic or Goldeneye? Wow, I can't believe we're talking um, video games. You guys are making me so happy. Uh, BYU is a super great um, college. Both that and the U have, and I don't know a whole lot about them, but I know that they're they're really good colleges. They're very highly spoken of and regarded. You guys can probably hear me opening and closing that box. And I would imagine it's annoying. <laughs> The AV-21 land speeder on farm. Let's go. <laughs> let's go. <laughs> All right, Tara, let's get serious. Hit me. If you get too serious, I reserve the right to uh, uh, see myself out. Just kidding. I'll do my best. I gotta find a way to have good posture while I do this. My past, oh wow, you are the question master. How do I think that my past has benefited my present? Well, um, I wouldn't change any of it. No matter how, hold on. Sometimes you have hair and there are like moments and you're like, man, I wish I didn't have hair. I need to go buy hair ties. I'm out. I have some. I just lost them. I need to clean my room. Anyways, um, we're talking about this beautiful question. How do you think your past has benefited your present? Well, I don't think I'd take any of it back. Um, no matter how crappy something from my past was, taking it back would change where I'm at today and change who I've become today. And I'm very proud of, of the person that I am. I'm very proud of, of, of the quality of character that I believe myself to have. Um, I'm very proud of the hurdles that I've, that I've conquered. You know, I'm, I have a lot of things that I'm not proud of as a part of my story, but the man that I am today is, is something that I have no qualms with being proud of. I have no trouble getting up in the morning and looking myself in the eyes in the mirror, which was not always true, you know? And I don't know, this might sound like egotistical. And I definitely say some of my weaknesses are so some things I let's let's word it this way. I have a I have the ability to be self-centered and I have the ability to be selfish. Um, in fact, I'm really good at those two things. And they're they're things that I work on because I don't think that those are very admirable traits. So those are things that I, you know, try to stay aware and present of. But um where was I going with that? Gosh, darn it. I'm screwed. It's gone. <laughs> it's gone. <laughs> wow. Swiss cheese in there, dude. I used to be a crack smoker. There is probably some damage in my head. Yeah, I do need hair ties. What was I talking about? Will someone remind me? I feel like it was so good. It was this question, but I had gotten to a place that I don't remember. I do need a song. That's closer. No way, Tara. I'm proud of us. When people tell me that, it makes me feel not alone. And it's a really good feeling, which is weird because, you know, none of us should be smoking that. But knowing that there are other people out there that I relate with is really friggin' sweet, I have to say. That are doing good and not currently engaging in such said activities. 
weakness, self-centered. That's right. Um, but I don't remember where I was taking those things. Oh, no, I don't know. Anyways, your initial question, I, um, my past has benefited my present in a, in a myriad of ways that like can't be quantified. Like, like the, the mistakes that I've made and the dark paths that I've walked have affected my, my present, maybe even more than the good stuff. I think that the best teacher is like something that we don't like, like the whole purpose of the body being able to feel pain is so that the body doesn't hurt itself. You know, like I think that negative stimulus in general, obviously there's exceptions to every rule, but I think negative stimulus teaches and the fact that I had an abundance of negative stimulus growing up, I think I learned a lot, you know, I don't think it's necessarily like a one-to-one -one like conversion kind of thing, but, uh, I think I, I, man, I made out like a bandit. I could have, I, I it could have been so much worse. You know, I was never, I can think of off the top of my head, a bunch of situations that, you know, could have been a part of my story that weren't. So, you know, I had, I had a family that loved me no matter what, regardless the whole time. And that's a big deal. You know, I had, I had, a, I had a, a lot, I had a lot going for me. Um, so I feel grateful to be present period. I feel grateful to be seen and not viewed. And I am so, so happy to be a part of, uh, for a long time, that's all I ever wanted was to be a part of. And, and now I, I choose what to be a part of, you know what I mean? It's not like, it's not like that anymore. It's not like I'm look, I'm like looking through the glass anymore. My pleasure, Cinderella. My absolute pleasure. I think that this is a really good spot to stop. We've touched on a lot of things. Um, and I think, honestly, I probably could have cut it a little sooner. Um, but I, you know, no regrets, y'all. We're going to keep moving forward with our chins up, our heads held high, uh, and we're going to move forward together. You know, um, whether that we're talking about the boat whether we're talking about in our own personal lives with our family, our friends, and those around us. Um, let's start acting and living as, as if we, if you have, you should have at this point, we'll, we'll go back over some basics so that we can lay our own ground rules and whatnot. But at this point, if you've been around the boat at, for any length of time, you should have an idea in your head of, of where you want to be, of, of where you would like to be headed, you know, some things you may want to change in your life for the better. You have this idea, this visual in your head. Um, let's start acting and living as if that was already true. I'm already that person. These changes have already been made. I would like to, to put on some muscle weight. I would like to, you know, I'd like to put on some weight. I'd like to get a little bigger, more fit. Um, you know, so I'm going to start living as if. I'm going to start eating another egg in the morning with my breakfast. I'm going to have second breakfast. You know, I'm going to go to the gym when I don't feel like going to the gym. You know, that kind of thing. That's just a simple example. But if you have this idea and visual in your head of, of a goal or like, uh, like somewhere that you want to be, some person that you want to be, start living as if you already are that person or you already are in that place doing that thing. All right. That's your homework. And we'll see you in the morning. This has been The Lifeboat. This is Captain Spanx Calhoun. And it's been a pleasure. We'll see you tomorrow.